Except for me. I wouldn't even take money from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They threw me a concert in Los Angeles, and they said, Bernie, we want to give you all this money. And I said, no, I cannot take the money from you directly because I, you are like a super PAC, and I do not take money from super PACs. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guy, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Clare. Hey now, welcome back, Liberty lovers, Liberty curious, even the Liberty fearful. This is the 182nd episode of this program, and today's show notes can be found at lionsofliberty.com slash 182. If you enjoy our roundtable discussions, like the one you're about to hear today, you can help us out by shopping through our Amazon affiliate link. This costs you nothing at all to do, well, except for the price of whatever you buy. Just head on over to lionsofliberty.com slash Amazon Bookmark that link, and anytime you shop at Amazon, you can send us a little kickback to help keep the lights on here at the Lions of Liberty Studios. And we really appreciate the help because we need a lot of help to keep covering all this crazy political stuff. And there's been so much going on in the last week. The Iowa caucus, Rand Paul dropping out. We had a Democrat debate. We had a Republican debate. We're going to try to touch on all of it here today. And first, I'm going to bring in my esteemed panel, starting with Lions of Liberty co-founder, Felony Friday, weekly podcast host, John Odermatt in Pittsburgh. What's up? What is going on, Mark? It is. Uh, it's good to be back talking about some debates. Uh, that was actually a pretty pretty fun debate last night. I thought. I don't know. I, That's I enjoyed what I'm it hearing. a little bit. And full disclosure, due to my some of my professional obligations, I was not able to actually watch the debate. So I'm going to rely on you guys to sort of guide me through. And um, full disclosure number two, it's also Sunday morning, so I'm going to presume that you might not actually be drinking an adult beverage right now, but maybe you are. Surprise me. Well, your presumption would be incorrect. Oh wow. <laughs> Drinking some uh, some coffee. Actually, drinking some. It's called purple purple tractor coffee. I bought it on Amazon, so you too can buy purple tractor coffee on Amazon through the Lines of Liberty link and help out the show. But I got some uh, little whiskey in there and a little Bailey's. So just take taking it easy. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Well, in fairness, it's three hours earlier for me. So that's true. I'm there. May be adult beverages later in the day. And uh, also, we could not do this without the um, the. Incredibly insightful legal commentary of our legal counsel, Mr. Rico from Cleveland. What's up, chums? It's, uh, great to be on today. That debate was fantastic. I hear bo- in our pre-debate chat, both of you guys were our pre-show chat. Both of you guys were just telling me how this was the was this the best debate you've seen yet. Well, it was on Most ABC, but. Uh, well known, it was produced by Lauren Michaels because the opening <laughs> was definitely straight from Saturday Night Live. The, the Ben Carson just clueless from the beginning. It was, I don't know, I didn't know what was happening, but I was delighted. It, it was just hilarious. All right, and- well. We'll get into the debate a little bit first, but first I want to tick back the clock because we haven't actually talked, at least not formally in podcast form, since uh, the craziness of the last week started with the Iowa caucuses, uh, Rand Paul dropping out. So let's just start with Iowa. Uh, What do you guys think of the results there? Was there any surprises? Were you shocked that Rand Paul didn't do better despite all of the the touting of his ground game and all his precinct captains and all his college students? And at the end of the day, after all that talk, 4.5%, 4.5%, pretty much exactly what the polls said he'd be at. Now, the, the good thing is, I mean, yeah, as his campaign touted, at least he beat quote-unquote establishment guys like Kasich, like Jeb Bush, like Chris Christie, um, just destroyed all of them. But, I mean, he's still well, well, well behind the the big boys who at this point are pretty much Trump, Cruz, and Rubio. So uh, any surprises for you, Odie, or is this, this, this kind of play out how you thought? Well, I mean, we've talked about this a lot, but Rand um, really touted the number of precinct captains that he had, had a thousand precinct captains, which was the same amount that apparently Rick Santorum had in 2012. Um, if he had a thousand precinct captains, if that's true, and then he only got like 7,000 and changed vote, those were some of the worst precinct captains that he could pick. That means each captain got like seven, seven people. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty terrible. But uh, yeah, it's, I think it was very disappointing for Rand. I expected him to do a lot better, not necessarily to win, although I did have some outside hope, which was probably just blind optimism. But uh, I, I thought they told at least beat Ben Carson. I mean, Ben Carson got like 17,000 votes, which I think is just nuts. But that's that's life, I guess, in Iowa. I don't know. Ben Carson continues to baffle in in so many ways, including the fact that people actually will take time out of their day to go to a caucus to support him. Uh, that blows my mind. Unless, unless they are doing it for pure comedic purposes, which I could actually respect and understand. <laughs> well, well the, uh, 
I mean, I, I found it interesting that apparently his caucus goers were so easily fooled by uh, Ted Cruz's um, political, um, whatever you call him, his team. They just seemed to, I, I guess, accept the fact that he was out of the race without verifying it. And you're, any- you're talking about this controversy where Ted Cruz, or one of Ted Cruz's staffers, I guess, tweeted out that he had a, a source that said Ben Carson was dropping out of the race, so uh, he welcomes the Ben Carson supporters to the Cruz campaign. And uh, I guess there, Cruz is trying to blame CNN, saying that CNN was saying he was leaving Iowa and going straight to Florida, which was true, in a, but he wasn't dropping out of the campaign. He was just going to rest, I guess, for a day after, because uh, everyone else is going straight to New Hampshire to campaign, and Ben and like, well, I'm, I could just use a day chilling at my pad in Florida first, guys. I so, mean, uh, I wonder if that really had a huge effect on anything. I, I doubt it had any effect. Cruise, I doubt it any effect at all. I, I, think, I think I think the way like the timeline played out that that uh, the cruise team didn't even call their precinct captains or their campaigners until like seven thirty, and the caucus has started at seven. So I, I really doubt it had any effect at all. I, I think Cruz probably won just because he likely has the most uh, well-oiled machine, I think, as far as, you know, the candidates. I think Trump may have just been under, uh, kind of undermined by his own maybe inexperience and, and how the caucus works. Because he, he seemed to be like, well, the polls say this, the polls say this, so I should have gotten this. Well, it's not quite how Iowa works. So I think maybe inexperience undermined him a bit. As far as Rand, it, definitely a, a disappointment and but his campaign wasn't going anywhere anyway. So just get, get on out and, and focus on the Senate and, and see what you can do in there. So do you guys Bye. think it was the right thing for Grant to do to drop out when he got that result? I mean, first of all, I think it was a, a terrible mistake to tout this ground game all the time. I mean, I, I think that was just such a huge snafu because if you, okay, if you either have the ground game that you claim and it works out great and you didn't talk about it, well, then, then you surprise the world. But if you're just, if you tout it and then you fail, well, now you just look like an idiot, which you do. And you just say, and now we can say, oh, look, all, all that talk about, oh, we're not reaching uh, people on cell phones because you're, you're only pulling landlines. Well, that all looks like nonsense now because th- you basically got the amount of votes that you were exactly pulled to get. So, I mean, you just – the whole campaign looks stupid and maybe that's one of the reasons they pretty much have to the bow out because they pretty much stake their whole game on so- shocking the world in Iowa. And while they did well compared to some other candidates, they definitely didn't shock the world. I mean, fifth place is, is not anything that any campaign should be touting as a success uh, it- in any way. Isn't it a fitting end to his campaign, though? Like, it, it seemed is. his whole ca- campaign was just misstep after misstep. And then, like you say, it goes, it ends in Iowa after whatever, you know, belief he had in his ground game that didn't materialize. So it, it just seems to be the perfect, the cherry on top of his uh, terrible campaign Sunday. Whoever his campaign team was, his campaign manager, I don't even know who they were, but they should never work in politics again. I mean, I was looking back at you know, some Rand articles that talked about his front runner stand at status back in uh, the end of 2014 and really all of 2015 or most of the first half of 2015 and still people until other people started jumping in. And they fumbled everything completely. I mean, he went from front runner top tier to just an also rant. He was even called an also rant. Haha. Uh-huh. Also rant. <laughs> Somewhere Brian McWilliams is is dropping a tear of joy at that pun. Wasn't he on time? Like as a new face of the Republican he Party? He was called the most interesting man in politics. Yeah. That, so he uh, really did well with that. <laughs> <laughs> really took that thing and ran with it. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, well, Rand, you disappoint us all. Yeah. You, at this I, point, I, I agree with you guys. I don't think he had a choice. He had to drop out. The only other state in the early states where he had any sort of a shot was Nevada. And he was, I mean, he was going to get crushed in South Carolina and other southern states. Crushed. Um, I did think he would stay in through New Hampshire. I mean, it, especially if I'm a, if I'm a Rand Paul, New Hampshire activist, I'm like, the fuck? Like, you know, I'm sure there's like a decent contingent up there working for him, even though his polling wasn't fantastic. But maybe it's just better to, to bow out and save face and not just stay in a race getting three and four percent while uh, while you have a Senate race going on. So I don't know. Is it is it is there? There's a lot of people on the Internet, uh, as this might not surprise you in the libertarian circles that have these conspiracy theories that, you know, the establishment knew Rand Paul was about to explode so they uh they brought in this democrat challenger and and that totally threw his campaign off and now they have to bow out of the race in order to combat this jim gray guy in 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 uh, kentucky and i just don't see that i think that's absurd because i mean i think Rand paul's got that seat pretty much locked up now maybe if he spent four months on a campaign trail getting two percent maybe that would hurt his senate campaign but i I think that's uh, a ridiculous theory have you guys seen any of that postulating out there 
I don't think there's any grand, grand conspiracy, but of course the Democrats would rather run someone against an incumbent Republican for the just at least to drain some of their money. I mean, that's just common sense. So, yeah, I mean, maybe if, if you look at it that way, yeah, the Democratic establishment put someone up to run against Rand for that reason, but there's no grand cons- conspiracy. To, I, I don't think it was out of race. concern he would be president, though, or concern he'd be the nominee if they didn't yeah, throw this little just, monkey that's, wrench. That's in. ridiculous. Yeah, no, I, I don't buy that for a second. And there's but. also the people that, that say I, – I mean I saw this a lot with, with Ron Paul's campaign four years ago. They say everyone keeps saying Rand Paul dropped out. He didn't drop out. He only suspended his campaign. That means he can still get delegates and still go win a broker convention. Yeah! And I'm just like, come on. <laughs> look, and look, I, I, if you're out there and, and you're in caucuses and you're in places where you can get liberty delegates elected as delegates to the convention, by all means, do that. That's a good thing no matter what. But uh, the idea that this is some clever strategy to focus on the Senate and and then usurp the, everybody at, at a broker convention is just ridiculous. Because if there's a broker convention, they're going to broker this thing for some establishment guy, some boring Mitt white bread. Yeah, for Mitt Romney. And you know, it's funny because a few months ago, Howie uh, on, on this very program asked me if I thought Mitt Romney had a better chance than not John Kasich. Who's the guy that's like similar to John Kasich but always on the, on the undercard? Do you guys remember? Um, man. Pataki. I always get those guys Pataki. confused. Pataki. Howie asked me if I thought um, uh, who had a better chance of being uh, the Republican nominee in 2016, George Pataki or Mitt Romney. And I th- we think we all agreed that Mitt Romney was more likely because Pataki had no chance. But in a broker convention scenario, maybe they just put up Romney again because why not? Wouldn't it be funny if there was a broker convention for the Republicans and for the Democrats and the Republicans put up Mitt Romney and the Democrats put up Joe Biden? (laughs) That would be amazing. I think I still expect Biden to get in the race at some point. I can't imagine the establishment for the Democrats want to go with Bernie. And is Hillary? I mean, her popularity is already sinking faster, you know, than the Titanic. And uh, she's probably going to get indicted at some point in time so is that really a candidate they want to drop uh trot out so well this I, is a I good segue i keep expecting biden to, to get in there and i think he's even been quoted as saying he still thinks about it every day even after he announced a month or two ago that he wasn't going to do it he was quoted after that saying he still thinks about it so <laughs> he said by this picture Picture Joe Biden sneaking into Obama's office and sitting in his chair and swirling around. <laughs> <laughs> sitting by the windowsill, looking outside at the, at the rain. Making t- fake phone calls to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, President Putin. Yeah, it's me, Joe. <laughs> oh, Joe. You're uh, your character. Can he just stay uh, on as vice president? Because then he's not like dangerous politically, but he, we can still like enjoy his, uh, his public persona. That's I think I, a lot of people forget about Joe Biden of the 80s, and uh, he was quite a dick. But I don't know if we really have time to, to get into that. <laughs> How about one example of why he's a dick well, in the 80s? I don't know anything was, about this. He was uh, on the um, – I forget what you call it. when uh, For the confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court, whatever committee it was. And I, I remember when Clarence Thomas was up for getting elected. I, I don't know. Do you guys remember that whole scandal? Oh, I do. Pubic hair and my coke. How could I forget? Yeah, yeah. But he, uh, Biden brought up just all bunch of different stuff that had no relevance and, you know, it was pure political because he didn't want Clarence Thomas to be on because he was a, a Republican. And so he, he pulled a lot of shenanigans back then. Um, and uh, I don't I don't remember all the details, but I just remember he was a dick. And I'm sure he still is. Am I the only one who watched the Democratic debate at all? Um, if you consider it at all, I, I watched like some of the highlights, but yeah, I didn't watch in the, the country. Debate. Well, I may, either one, either yeah, yeah. in the country I, or I wasn't able to watch any debates tonight. I'm relying totally on you guys to guide me through things. It, it was basically, it seemed to me that they were just arguing about who was least establishment, which was a hilarious argument for Hillary to make. They, she just kept saying, well, they don't want to see me. You know, all, all the Wall Street fears me. The healthcare industry fears me. <laughs> it's like, oh my, is anyone buying this for a second? And then, and then she, she tried to call out Bernie Sanders at one point, which was pretty uh, funny where she said, if you have something to say, just say it. Like about his kind of indirect uh, or his innuendos that she was crooked, and he, and he just went right back at her and said, "Well, I'll just say this: uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, I think he, he put the 
Wall Street was deregulated after this, and and uh, healthcare companies are making record profits after this. You know, basically saying politicians are bought. Uh, shocking. So it was quite a... Except for me. I wouldn't even take money from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They threw me a concert in Los Angeles, and they said, Bernie, we want to give you all this money. And I said, no, I cannot take the money from you directly because I, you are like a super PAC, and I do not take money from super PACs, but I will charge $500 a ticket to the show. That happened. Really? Yeah, the Chili Peppers wanted to throw a concert for him and give him all this money, and he's like, well, I can't take money from you guys directly, so no. So they're like, all right, we'll, we'll make each ticket an individual donation, but then the tickets are like $500 each or $1,000 each. We're like the two tiers of tickets. Like, oh, yeah, this is really for the uh, the working man here. Wow, yeah. I mean, it seems more honest just to take money from the Chili Peppers. Like, why is that terrible? Like, I mean, I know you can't take direct money from them, but let them form a super PAC. Like, what's the big deal? Is anyone going to can, can like accuse him of being bought, paid for by Anthony Kiedis? The Chili like, Pack? You're a sell- Chili, chili pack. pack. You're a sellout. You're just a slave to the Chili Pack. <laughs> well, spe- speaking of uh, super PACs, I think it was Howard Dean a couple days ago. It was responsible yeah! to that, that, that exchange. My favorite. Say, well, pretty much, I mean, unions are pretty much super PACs that the Democrats approve of. And Bernie Sanders is funded by all kinds of unions. So what the heck's the difference? I definitely agree with that. And I was really surprised that Howard Dean said that in defense of Hillary. But That's really the funny thing. The that was said in Democratic defense of Party her. under the bus. Yeah, he wasn't doing it to say, like, oh, yeah, super PACs are bad and these are another one. He was just saying, hey, we all do this. Whatever. That's just another one. No difference. Exactly. And, I, and he's got a good point. I always kind of liked Howard Dean. I always had a soft spot for him. Obviously, I don't agree with, like, most of his politics. But I like that he was really a- the only anti-war guy in 2004. I like this whole yeah thing. And then they just trotted him out, probably because he was so against the Iraq War. But now he's with Hillary Clinton. So how much could he have really meant that? <laughs> oh, uh, she's so terrible. I try to block most of that debate out of my mind. There, it, it, there wasn't much substance. Why really. does she insist on wearing a burlap sack to every public appearance? Is that the only thing she can fucking weasel her body into now? Uh, Not to chastise the woman in her in her older age, but my God, she picks sheep or her wardrobe department or whoever picks the absolute most atrocious outfits. Like they're not even clothes. It's just like it's just like a smock covered, uh, made of like potato sack material, whatever that is, burlap. I'm sure those outfits are so. Uh- you know, polled and tested and, and everything. And I, I don't know, I guess maybe there's a contingent of the population that likes birth. Grandma loves it. That's a very lovely sack Hillary's got on tonight. She's got my vote. The young people love burlap. That's, that's what it is. Uh, how many times did she say a first woman president? She's really hanging on. I think that's the only thing she can hang on to at this point. Uh, she really doesn't have a lot of momentum going for her. It looks like she's going to get trounced in New Hampshire, correct? Uh, if we believe the polls, I mean, if if these polls don't hold up, and as of now, New Hampshire polls are looking at Trump has a pretty good lead, and then Bernie has like a double double digit. I mean, he has got like fifty eight percent. The one I saw today, fifty eight percent to Hillary's, whatever the rest is, thirty. It was actually like fifty eight percent to like thirty something, and then so I don't know who the rest is. The rest is like O'Malley slash undecided, even though O'Malley dropped out. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I think the establishment or you know the Democrats have assumed that Bernie is going to win uh, New Hampshire, and then they go what to South Carolina next, and they're assuming Hillary is going to win. I think the next state where it's supposed to be like a real battleground is is Nevada, where it could go either way. And coming out of that, if Bernie wins Nevada, then I mean anything could happen. But e- even if Hillary gets the nomination, I can't I can't even imagine any way. No matter what Republican they put up, even if it's Trump or, or Cruz, I, I just cannot imagine her winning a general election. I just can't see it happening. Oh, I can. I totally can. I can picture Hillary winning a general election before I can picture Bernie winning a general election. Hey, why doesn't Bernie come out and say, we need to have the first Jewish president? He would be the first Jewish president, even though he's basically said he's an atheist. I mean, without actually saying that. But still, he would be the first Jewish president, technically. He should be saying that. Or he should mention it, at least. I don't know. It's kind of a slight to Jews, isn't it? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I feel slighted. Come on, Bernie. Aren't you rallying around him? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling the burn. My matzah has been burned. All right. So, but yeah, he doesn't really identify as Jewish. But uh, if you've ever been to um, Queens and met Jews there, Bernie is one of them. So it's a fact if you just listen to how he talks. 
Um, so is there, I, I actually find the Democratic race pretty intriguing because I, I really expected Hillary to just walk into this thing, um, I mean, a few months ago anyway. And, uh, you know, despite my reservations, because for a while I just saw Bernie as, as Democratic Ron Paul, that he was just going to be, you know, he was going to get young people excited whatever they're gonna love his socialist talk but then it's gonna kind of fizzle out in reality and that doesn't really seem to be the case i mean i by all and i mean i i would guess that he probably won iowa in reality just like ron paul won the delegates in iowa in reality like rick santorum won the votes in iowa in reality and yet i don't know if you guys remember this four years ago they they pretended Mitt romney won the iowa caucus for like a week before they would even admit that that santorum actually had the the popular vote there and the mm-hmm. democrats are even shadier because they don't put out results like the, Dem- the republicans put out actual votes They're, the democrats just give out percentages and i, th- I find that kind of odd well- and I'll- and the fact that Hillary essentially got the last delegates best by coin tosses in precincts that were supposedly, I guess, too too tied to actually make a decision. I mean, was there not one extra person on either side? I don't really get how that process could work where they could actually legitimately say, well, we after we tried everything, all we can do is flip a coin now. Well, that's amazing that your democratic process comes down to that. If, if, if really it's a tiebreaker by flipping a coin, maybe we need to go back to the drawing board a little bit and, <laughs> and figure something out. Because- maybe we re-vote or something. I mean, that's like, it's so insane to me. And, and, that, and how about this thing where Hillary wins six coin tosses? I mean, <laughs> what luck. What, what a lucky lady that <laughs> this one is. There was one count, one one county, and on the Democratic side at least, there was only one person, one caucus goer, and he says that he voted for Bernie, and Hillary got the delegate from that county. So I mean, what, Wait, yeah, it's, there was it's one crazy. caucus goer. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. It, it must have been like in the middle of nowhere in Iowa, which is all of Iowa. But <laughs> and he went voted Bernie, and then they the, they chose Hillary having the delegate. Yeah, they gave they gave Hillary the delegate. Wow, so one man gets to choose a delegate, basically. <laughs> I guess he's the delegate. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's he going to vote well, for if he's the only one there? What about – I mean I don't know a lot about this, but there's been talk about the super delegates and Hillary's just crushing Sanders in that. I think. Oh, yeah, and that, that's why I, I can't see Bernie actually being the nominee because if it's even close, I mean – Hillary's got all the super delegates, and that's the thing people don't realize about the Democrats' side. I mean, both sides have super delegates, but on, on the Democrat side, there the de- I think there are more super delegates that have more power. I guess super delegates have more of a final say in the at the actual convention vote, so they can basically skew things. Even if Sanders comes in with the, theoretically the most delegates, the super delegates have like a weighted weighted vote, I guess. So yeah. they could still bring it to Hillary, even if he went in there with with the su- theoretical amount of delegates to win. And right Can someone now, explain how superdelegates are chosen not for our really. audience and for myself? I can't. <laughs> can, <laughs> can someone? Maybe. But they're not on this show today. No. I'm pretty I sure they're, de- they're basically just party hacks who are just as establishment as they come, and they're just there to, you know, see things that uh, go the way they should. That's that's what I think. So they're they're like pre-selected people that are going to be delegates no yeah, matter they're what. Pre- they don't have to. Exactly. They're, 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 they're chosen, I believe, by, by the DNC. Right. Yeah, but uh, from what I saw, she has a forty-five to one advantage right now. But I, I think, like, just in ratio, but I think the total is about three hundred eighty-five to I don't know twenty or something like that, or, or t- fifteen in, in super delegates. So I, I don't know if that's all the. Su- I, I doubt that's even all the super delegates there are. So it's going to be tough for Bernie, I guess, to win this. Without just winning every single primary, which I don't think he's doing that great in the South, unless I'm mistaken. So we're gonna get, we may get Hillary, and then she may get indicted, and then we may get Joe. She's not gonna get indicted. The Obama administration already basically said they're not gonna indict her. I mean, the FBI has no power to indict; they can only recommend an indictment. It would have to actually come from the Justice Department, and I don't. Unless Obama actually has it in for Hillary, then they're not gonna indict her. There's no way. Well, the, well, the one thing, is, even, if, even if they don't indict her, what you could see happen is the head of the FBI could resign over it and say, if you're not going to yeah. indict her, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't want to work for the government be, anymore, which, which could happen. Fixed. Yeah, and that, that's not going to look good for Obama. Does he really want to go out his last year without everyone remembering the FBI director um, resigning because he won't prosecute a completely – obviously corrupt person and, and does he really like hillary I, I can't imagine that he does i know i don't get the I, from things i've read and heard I, it, it 
I think the Clintons and Obamas are not actually that close, even though she did work for his administration, because uh, he basically, she was supposed to be coronated in 2008, and he swooped in with this amazing campaign uh, that basically just destroyed her. And, and I don't think, and yeah, I guess she gave some concessions and she ended up as Secretary of State, but I think that was more a political move than a, I really like Hillary and want her around kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. He, he wanted to banish her as far away as possible, so... Like, go uh, spend four years in the Middle East, Hillary. Have fun. And uh, do a bang-up job with Benghazi and all that. Thanks for your help. If only she actually spent those years physically in the Middle East. That would have been nice. Not creating an email server. Yes. Hey, oh. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to this Republican debate because, um, as you guys know, I did not get a chance to watch it because I've got a crazy week going on uh, in my professional life. But, um... I heard it was pretty entertaining, and I did hear, I did see the intro, the Saturday Night Live Lauren Michaels produced intro. Why don't uh, I'm sure most people are going to have seen it by the time this airs uh, on Monday. But uh, well, Enrico, why don't you just describe uh, some of the shenanigans that went down with this with this open? Well, just the opening w- was great. I, I was not excited to watch this debate at all, um, but then the opening sucked me in. I think <laughs> Carson was either the second or third person introduced. And they said his name. I heard it. And he walked kind of like in the back and then he just stopped before he actually got on the stage. And then I think the next guy was Ted Cruz. And Cruz comes around the corner and he looks at Carson like, <laughs> what the F are you doing? Like, what like, are you doing here? Oh, well, I'm going. He just looks at him. He's like, uh, OK. And he, he keeps going. And then like the next guy and they're all like, what? well, and then Trump was next. And then Trump. Or no, I don't know if he was next. Rubio might have been after that. But then but, Trump comes out and he kind of stands there with Carson, too. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I, I don't know what tr- I think Trump was just kind of milk in the moment, probably because he saw Carson was just being stupid. But uh, so Trump's like, hey, I can get more FaceTime probably. But the other funny thing was they're like, at our last candidate, Donald Trump, and he comes <laughs> out. But of course, there's still an empty podium because they hadn't announced Kasich yet. No, so, what the, what the best part is when they cut to the shot of all of uh, the, you know, the whole podiums and the, the lady goes, and here are our Republican candidates. And there's three empty podiums because Trump and Carson and Ruby are, none of them are out there yet because they're, st- they're still confused in the back. But, <laughs> yeah, but they introduced Donald Trump as the last candidate, but I don't think they ever introduced Kasich. Or they he, just, he just came running out like, I'm, like here, oh, here, I'm still here. No, it's actually – Chris Christie actually chimed in. He's like, uh, what about John Kasich? Uh, can I introduce him? Like <laughs> funniest moment Chris Christie's yeah, had. This ever. is – come on, ABC. Really? This is uh, – I don't know how many people got fired after that production well, last night. When, uh, when Trump came out and was standing next to next to Carson, you could like read his lips when he he said something like, oh, they messed up. They messed up, Ben. But, no, you messed up, Ben. You're standing yeah, like but- a moron. The one, the funniest part is like the, the guy behind the curtain, Ben Carson standing there looking around, looking up at the ceiling. The guy's waving <laughs> at him like, get out there. Get out there. <laughs> and Ben looks at him like, what? What, what are you talking about? It was about? like a high school talent competition <laughs> where the, the people didn't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, go, <laughs> go on the stage, Ben. It's not your first debate. But I think what, someone tried to cover for him and say, oh, well, the crowd was just clapping too loud. Well, uh, Cruz heard his announcement. Rubio heard the announcement. I, ben, come on, Ben. But this is the impression I got. And as you guys know, I, I work on live TV stuff, and I've seen the behind the scenes of how this stuff works. And I, I, my, <clears throat> that guy waving at Ben Carson was the stage manager, and his job was to tell each guy, okay, when you're getting called, all right, you go out and go up to the stage. And I think Carson didn't, for whatever reason, maybe it wasn't communicated to him right, more likely based on what he've seen, we've seen of him, he was just a little confused. He was supposed to just, like, come out when his name was called. And I do believe he probably didn't hear his name, like, with the applause, but that his name wasn't supposed to be his cue to walk out. His cue to walk out was supposed to be the stage manager, you know, telling him to go walk out. But so then he didn't realize that. He thought he was supposed to wait there for his name, which he, I, I can believe he didn't hear because it, it can be difficult to hear. Like, he's not, you know, he doesn't have a, you know, program audio going into his headset or anything. He's just standing there. So, <clears throat> but then the stage manager's kind of waving him in and they send Trump in and then it, it just cascades. Uh, basically, it was just, they, they, they really messed up production wise too i mean I, I, I i'm sure ben was confused but the, the way they kept going and kept bringing people out i mean they should have had just had the stage manager physically go push him out there because it was just i mean you saw him on camera anyway it was just it was just ridiculous but just there was definitely production all the way out to his podium yeah annoying. i mean there were definitely production snafus too they should not have just they basically just kept reading the card as if the guys were coming out
out there when they weren't even coming out there. Like Trump had still stayed back there. I mean, I don't even know how you deal with that. There's no really good way to deal with that in live TV because you're live. You can't do anything except look stupid and try to look as not stupid as possible. But boy, a disaster. But the highlight of the Republican debate so far. <laughs> it, it immediately perked my interest in the rest of the debate, which – um, was three hours, by the way. I, I couldn't. I thought it was a joke when I saw it on my guide channel. These guys was, are messing with me. <laughs> Eight to eleven. I'm like, oh, they're counting an hour of post game recap. But no, it went to about ten fifty. So the actual debate was three hours. Uh, it started about eight ten, I think, and then it went to about ten fifty. So wow. two hours forty minutes. Or so. uh, what happened to Trump? Like two uh, or three commercial breaks. It was, yeah. it was like no breaks. What happened to Trump's whole, like, uh, I negotiate these debates, so we're not going to do more than two hours? I guess they gave up on that, huh? Yeah, I think that was just a talking point. Uh, and there were no, no opening statements either. Remember at the beginning, oh. there was a big thing, we're going to have opening statements. They just jumped oh. right in and started asking I, questions. Speaking of Trump, he was great, too. Because, well, I, I don't know about policy-wise, but getting into it with the audience was also a first that I, I, I can't remember seeing in a, a debate before um, because he wasn't getting a lot of cheers. And I think at, at some point he, he gave the quiet sign to Jeb. It's like, He's like, grown-ups are talking here, Jeff, or, or, or whatever, whatever he said. And he got a lot of booze. And then he said, well, you, you know, these are all political donors in the audience. And he was like back and forth. He's like, oh, it's a, it's a fact. It's a fact. Uh, they, they told me it's all for donors, which it, I'm sure it is. It's true. No, I mean, the people that get into the, the those debates are all – it's not like the general public just buys a ticket. It's all like Republican Party people that are connected in some way. So – it, it makes sense that they might boo Trump more than they might boo some of the more establishment guys, I guess. It, it was a genius move. And, I mean, I, I can't believe that other outsider candidates like Rand Paul or Ron Paul years ago wouldn't have thought of something like that. If you're not getting cheers, if you're getting boos, that's because it's all establishment donors out there. It was it was a brilliant move by Trump. And, you know, I, I think it kind of could be something we could see future politicians use to kind of separate themselves from from you know the establishment that's paying for a lot of these candidates. I, I wonder if every voter for Jeb gets a ticket, like if that's promised, because you know <laughs> he's like, I got a hundred tickets and I don't have a hundred voters, so <laughs> sign you up can now actually, and you go you to the debate. Sign up now, you can bring a plus one, <laughs> free steak dinner, whatever you need. So, so I did catch a few highlights of this debate or lowlights. I don't know. And it seems that um, – to me, it seems like the topic of torture was big with these guys. And um, I see uh, Jeb was – well, Jeb was saying he would uh, launch a preemptive strike. That sounds like a good time. That's never gone wrong before. Trump uh, – I guess Cruz was saying waterboarding isn't torture. Then Trump was like, well, yeah, whatever. I don't care what it is. I'm bringing it back. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Was, was, was that a, a big it, theme here, warmongering, especially without Rand Paul on the stage? I guess it, it mostly probably went unchallenged. Pretty much, yeah. I, I think Cruz went into the legal definition as far as what torture is. I, I don't know where this legal definition is. Probably I guess anybody who point. claims waterboarding isn't torture should just go get waterboarded and then say, "Look, see, it's no bigs." Uh, well, I'm sure he wrote uh, some kind of opinion for a Supreme Court justice back when he was clerking, and he found a way to make it not torture, but. I don't think any guys were were very great as far as libertarian on, on the torture issue, and and no one brought up well is the information even reliable? Because I believe there was a hearing on this maybe what a year ago with the Senate, and and they found at least the committee that it, the information they got wasn't reliable. Uh, so exactly what are we torturing these people for? But Oh, yeah, that's basically a, a proven fact that you know, torture doesn't produce valuable information. It produces information that isn't necessarily information. It produces whatever the tortured yeah. thinks that the torture E wants to hear. It doesn't need to be accurate information. If they're saying, tell me which five guys did this with you, and it's, it's these guys, tell me, then eventually he'll just tell them those guys because that's well, what they wanted to hear. And the other thing they – they didn't seem to get is like, well, if we had to torture someone to stop a, you know, imminent attack, well, one, that ticking time bomb scenario. It's such nonsense. It, it, it doesn't really ever come into play. And the second thing is, you know, if you're torturing a guy a week after you capture him, two weeks after you capture him, even probably a couple of days after you capture him, his intel is not going to be 
updated. You know, they, people are going to know, oh, they got uh, whatever, you know, Joe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they got Joe Zarkawi. <laughs> yeah. So they may be torturing on me, whatever. We're going to have to change this up a little bit. So, you know, they're, they're getting stale information. It, it, but God forbid they actually bring up those points. It's all, yeah, I'm, I'm all for waterboarding. I'm all for skinning people alive. It seems like such a, a medieval, literally, mentality. Like, didn't we, like, stop doing this, like, hundreds of years ago and then realize that that's completely inhumane and, uh, like, a civilized society doesn't do things like that to people? But well, I, it's, apparently it's not. It's interesting you bring that up, uh, medieval, because that was that was how Trump justified it. He said, we've got people <laughs> chopping people's heads off. It's, it's like, medi- we haven't seen anything like this since medieval times. So, yes, I bring it back waterboarding i'd bring back worse than waterboarding so because people are being you know savages and barbaric then trump is going to stoop down to their level to match it that's his justification so yeah people are if people are acting sense. like barbarians we should also become barbarians and just completely devolve our society into just barbarism and, and torture and uh let's just bring back the middle mid ages that's uh, the, the medieval times yeah. i guess and that's i mean that uh, that trump's stance on torture that is like a that's Kind that of a really deal scares me about his candidacy. I mean, his foreign policy overall, I don't think he would have the, you know, the military spread into, you know, nation building and things like that and all kinds of, you know, ground troops and, and wars. But he he definitely does not give a shit about civil liberties or about about individual rights, I don't think. Now, I get the impression he's against wars because he doesn't like all the unnecessary spending, but he has no problem torturing the shit out of people. That, ain't, that doesn't cost too much. Just need a, a, some water and a bucket. I mean, is there is there any doubt that they haven't, you know, captured the wrong people, perhaps innocent people? There's no way I believe every single person they detained on terror, terrorism charges is actually guilty of that. Oh, There's no. no way they haven't made a mistake. So basically, no due process, plus waterboarding or worse. Uh, that, that's quite the platform to run on. It. <laughs> Warms the neocons' heart, I'm sure, but it, it's scary to a normal person. Oh boy! Now, and and, and uh, <clears throat> oh, go ahead. well, I don't know if you guys want to keep talking about that, that issue, but uh, who was talking? I think it was Cruz. Or, uh, they were talking about the, I think the Gulf War. They were dropping what 1,100 bombs a day, and we're only dropping 15 to 30 bombs now. So we need to. Step step up our game, basically. I think he wants to go back to 1,100 bombs a day against ISIS, which I, I don't know how you have 1,100 targets a day. But <laughs> well, in the Iraq War, Mr. Cruz, we were battling a country and a government of a country, and I don't agree with that war. But if you're prosecuting a war against a government of a country, you're going to have a whole ton of targets to strike because you target every government facility, every defense building, every – you target energy uh, production. You target all these things because you're at a war against this country's government. But when you're at a war against ISIS, what are you bombing all the time? I mean the, you can bomb their trucks I guess when you identify them. But uh, if you're going to drop 1,100 – bombs a day trying to catch isis in the middle east i mean mostly you're probably just gonna be killing a bunch of innocent people Uh, that's that's my uh i guess my very uh maybe it's a naive foreign policy view that some might say but uh, i don't think it is i think the naive view is the one that says if we just bomb the crap out of everybody things will things will turn around he was scary and he he had the nerve to say well, I don't. I don't trust having a person like Donald Trump with their finger on the nuke button. <laughs> well, I don't want your finger anywhere near that. Ted Cruz said that. I believe it was Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is literally the one that said he wants to see if sand glows. He's the one, the last one I want. Him and Rick Santorum maybe are like the last two I want near the button. Yeah, that's that's been Cruz's big thing recently. His attack against Trump that Donald Trump doesn't have the temperament to be president because he goes on these Twitter rages. So instead of going on, <laughs> instead of going on Twitter Twitter rage when he's president, he's going to just start nuking people. That's that's right. Yeah, I mean, I, the whole rage against Trump. Now, I don't support Trump's policies pretty much at all. Um, obviously, the torture stuff is terrible. Uh, the stuff on civil liberties is terrible. But but it's funny to me how people go after him on things. That every other Republican candidate, now that Rand Paul is gone, would do and advocate too. I mean, literally. Eminent domain. Oh, my God. He said this ter- thing about how he likes eminent domain. Uh, okay, I'm, ag- I'm against that too. Every other candidate up there is for o- eminent domain. Absolutely. 100%. They're all for the Keystone Pipeline. Keystone Pipeline uses eminent domain. 
they're all for it. So let's not act like Trump is different than them on, on these well, things. I think there was a little bit of a decision, and I don't know all their their policies, but I, I kind of agreed with – well, it's hard to say. I think the Keystone Pipeline is more of a, a public – you know, thing than a private thing, although I'm sure it's going to be a crony capitalism who gets to work on it and all that. It absolutely but, is. It's all crony capitalism. But I think in theory, it's at least a public kind of interest because it's, you know, energy, um, it's a utility or, or whatever you want to call it. Is Whereas, Rico on here advocating eminent domain right now? Is that happening? <laughs> I'm not advocating. I'm saying uh, the, the difference was Donald was all for – uh, eminent domain for private use, which is completely contrary to the whole history of what eminent domain was. And there was that change in the Supreme Court, I guess, probably 10 years ago, where they said, oh, yeah, that's fine, which was ridiculous. But I, I think there was a big difference between, uh, you know, taking someone's property for public and private, though under neither situation is it good. I just think that taking it for your own private interest is, is much, much worse. Well, as much as I'm opposed to eminent domain, it is in the Constitution. Is that not right? But it – well – For public like, utilities or whatever. Yeah, public it was originally understood as you know for the public – for a public interest. Not, I, I just don't see the Keystone Pipeline as a public interest. Like I mean most of us are not going to benefit from that. People are going to have their property taken. Other people are going to – some people are going to get jobs from it. Some people are going to get energy from it. But it's mostly going to be the companies involved that profit from it more than you know the public. But I, I see what you're saying. The, in theory, that, if you buy the theory of it, then you know you could make more of a case for a Keystone Pipeline type thing than for Donald Trump's hotels. I think that the history of eminent domain was more like we're going to take the – you know, your back acres on your farm and put a highway through it um, because there's no other place to put this highway. And I, I doubt that's actually 100 percent what ha- ever happened in, in practice. But I think that was more the theory than, you know, what they're talking about with the Keystone Pipeline or certainly his eminent domain for a bigger parking lot, which actually is true. So uh, well, that, that it was, was kind of, it was kind of funny last night, Rico, or yeah, last night watching this debate. And Donald Donald was just talking about eminent domain, and then you you said Donald the big difference between eminent domain versus you know it's public versus uh, private use. You uh, sent that out on the, on the live blog, and then like thirty seconds later, Jeb Bush says the exact same thing. So the only conclusion is, is that Jeb Bush is following along on our live blog, and it's prompting his notes. <laughs> I was scared that I had the same train of thought as Jeb. It made me question my intelligence, really. Um, so. Not a high point in my my life. <laughs> Give yourself a pat on the <laughs> what back. What can you do? Um, well, thank you. What about I thought was interesting was Christie was re- relentless in attacking Rubio last night. Um, Which makes sense because he's the kind of the establishment golden boy. And even though you know Christie tries to be like, I'm not establishment because I'm a governor, like whatever. He is kind of more of an establishment guy and at least uh, you know, in how he's portrayed – and how he's seen by the public as opposed to how Donald and maybe even Cruz to an extent are kind of push themselves as outsiders. Um, but Christie just went nuts on Rubio, I guess, because because I guess I guess he sees Rubio as his biggest competition. Does that that seems to make sense to me. So, well, how was he going after Rubio? What were his biggest talking points? Well, he was going after him saying that Rubio had a, t- a 25 second script that he read from and he kind of proved it because after he attacked him on it. Rubio went back to the same script again, and the script, at least for that question or, or that part of the debate, was about President Obama knows exactly what he's doing. He's trying to change the country. You know, basically, he, he's a socialist, blah, 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 which I think is, is pretty true. I mean, President Obama does know what he's doing. He's doing it intentionally. And I think Christie and uh, some of the other guys on the stage um, were saying that, oh, it's so obvious. President Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He has no idea what he's doing. The country's a mess. But which I mean, it's kind of like who who really cares? Is that really important? If if you think he knows what he's doing, or if he doesn't know what he's doing, and that's why the country is falling apart. E- either, either way, it's still it's still the same end result. So it was kind of stupid a stupid attack, but I think it worked at least in that instance because Rubio literally said the exact same thing like three times in a row when Christie questioned him on it, and he came off looking like a complete moron. Yeah, uh, Rubio. Oh, go ahead, Mark. No, I was just going to say, I mean, Christie's some, someone to call someone out for using a script. In the last debate, all he said to every answer was, Hillary's the worst, Hillary's the worst, Obama's the worst, vote for me. Oh, and, and how many times did Christie bring up, oh, I was the prosecutor, and his, his go-to line is always, 
Well, when you're an executive, you you have to stand up and uh, face the consequences of your decisions. Whereas if you're in the Senate, you know you can kind of hedge your bets or whatever. You know his point was. And he brings that up all the time. And I mean, there I'm sure there's some truth to it, obviously, but I just don't see that as a, a winning argument. I, I don't think he's really going to inspire people to vote for him over Rubio because he was a governor. And, and the other thing is. I think all this, the more Christie goes after Rubio, the happier Donald Trump has to be. He's like, good, take some of Rubio's votes. You can do better. Have Kasich stick around too. And uh, the longer all those guys are in it, the better it is for Trump because they're just going to, I think, chip away at each other's support. Whereas Donald, if he can keep up around 30, whatever, you know, he's polling at. Uh, you know, it, it works out perfectly for him. So I don't really see the, the grand value of attacking Rubio for Chris. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I guess we'll see how it plays out. And did, did was Rubio, uh, did he do much to counter the attacks or was he just no, kind of? He was not good. I Everywhere I'm reading it, actually immediately after the debate, um, Maybe within a minute, they were all like, Rubio did terrible. Rubio did terrible. And the news stories I've seen today, this morning, all say Rubio did really bad. I don't think he came across as well, but I've never liked him. So I thought I was biased. But He, he oh. was not very energetic on stage. He looked tired. I don't know if, if the campaign's starting to wear on him, but he, he didn't look good. And, yeah, his, his responses were canned. There was no passion. I, I mean, out of everyone on the stage – I think Cruz had a pretty bad debate, but I think Rubio probably had the worst debate out of everyone. Even even John Cassius did better, I think. I, I definitely think Rubio did a terrible job. I actually didn't mind Kasich. I, I don't remember why I didn't mind him. I guess he didn't say anything. That I think that's really you're the stuff. actual demographic he's going for. He's going for people that think, well, I don't really mind the guy. I don't know why, but I don't remember what right. he said or did or what he stands for but i know he talked about ohio like in every answer that's why you like him (laughs) yeah the uh booming you know threshold of civilization here in ohio his answer to every question is (laughs) oh it's like like we tell our veterans if you can drive a truck in afghanistan you can drive a truck in ohio because they're pretty (laughs) similar ohio and afghanistan not many differences (laughs) I must have been going to the bathroom. I'm like, there <laughs> might be a few minor differences in those jobs. I Just hope saying. we have better infrastructure. One, you yeah. might have an explosive device planted on the road <laughs> to uh, explode your truck. The other one, you might have to deal with some traffic. I don't know. Not really. I didn't see any traffic, actually, when I was in Ohio. Yeah, You're okay. talking about the explosive devices in Ohio, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Afghanistan doesn't have much traffic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Precisely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I think uh, – Trump probably he was the most amusing, which is usually the case. So, and give it uh, to Trump; he has made this campaign just the most entertaining it, it could possibly be. Because you know, uh, four and eight years ago, to me, Ron Paul made it entertaining. I think we were and educational. It was both with him because he was really great. His moments were great and exciting, and he was actually really good at communicating ideas. Now, Rand. Rand was supposed to be that. He wasn't really fired up. To me, Rand never seemed like he was really into the president thing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I really think he was just kind of like phoning in the whole campaign, it seemed like. It never, never seemed like he was passionate about it. And I'm not saying he didn't want to be president because why, th- why go through all this work if he didn't want to? But I don't know. It just, especially towards the end. I mean, his last closing statement on that last debate that he was in, he was just like, um, yeah, I'm like, I'm a constitutional conservative and, um, I don't know, I probably won't be president or anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> so just remember me, but I mean, it really didn't seem like he had any passion and say what you will about Trump. I mean, he seems pretty damn passionate to me. I mean, I, I think that's one of the reasons he connects with people is he's up there. He's fired up. He's not afraid to just say whatever comes out of his mouth, including shouting down, you know, the actual audience of the debate he's in. I mean, these are qualities that people like policies aside, you know, waterboarding and Plus, aside. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree. And I, I think Rand got caught in between trying to please the neocons at the beginning of this campaign, at least, thinking, well, I may have this libertarian base, but I need to expand it to include the hawks on the far right. And he just never, I mean, that, that's not a And instead, he shrunk it. Yeah, you, you, you can't. You can't expand the libertarian base to 
include the Hawks and, and make anyone happy. So it's really incredible because I mean, Ron Paul got 26,000 votes in Iowa. Rand Paul got seven something thousand. That means that either, either a lot of those Ron people, Ron Paul people weren't really Liberty people. A lot of them were just constitutional conservatives. And if you're a constitutional conservative, Ron Paul seemed pretty good. But now if that's all you were, maybe Ted Cruz seems just as good. Or, or a lot of them were just, you know, lashed on to populism overall. And maybe a lot of those people are just, you know, getting into Trump or even getting into Bernie Sanders. Maybe they weren't, you know, really – maybe they didn't really accept the message of liberty fully. They just kind of liked that he was anti-establishment, liked that he was standing up for things in a similar way that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump are. So a lot of Ron Paul's support might not have been, you know, as, as pure libertarian as a lot of us might want to think. I think like so many things in life, it's it's like 2080. Probably a lot of Ron Paul support in Iowa and everywhere else. 20% really, you know, loved his message, you know, became, you know, libertarian, started to, to you know, read more about liberty and philosophy. And the other 80% said, yeah, this guy's against the establishment. He wants to, he wants to end the Fed. Yeah, he, he wants to shrink government. All right. And then that 80%, you know, when the next candidate came along, Donald Trump, yeah, he's against the establishment. Right. He, you know, he, he, he's a businessman. He knows what he's doing. All right. So I mean it's it's I think it's a it's a twenty eighty thing. I, so maybe the twenty percent that was pure for Ron out of that maybe maybe half of that was for Rand. The other the other, the other half of that twenty percent was disgusted by Rand. I don't know. I'm not good at math, so I can't really break down if that comes down <laughs> to seven thousand or not. But yeah. well, I think it's really disappointing if if that's the case that people were not really understanding Ron's message um, and, and continuing it forward if all it was was anti-establishment then i guess the the progress i thought our the libertarian movement had made eight years ago and four years ago wasn't as, as great as i i thought it was if if they're switching to bernie if i if i meet a ron paul supporter who uh is now supporting bernie i'm definitely gonna have a lot of questions for them and i'll, I'll be quite upset but if you find them let me know and they can come on the show and maybe we can have a discussion about it be I'm serious because I actually want to – now look, I can see su- supporting Bernie, not supporting Bernie, but tacitly kind of rooting for him as a best-case scenario or a least bad-case scenario. I don't know. I mean I, I certainly would – I'm cheering for Bernie over Hillary. I mean I, I definitely want to see Hillary go down. I can see why you would see Bernie as left harmful in some ways. I mean he's not out there advocating torture. He's not out there – you know he, he you know he is not a corporatist. So there are there are reasons to – Say okay, knowing all the options left, like I think Bernie might be the least bad option, especially if maybe he's constrained on his economic stuff by a Republican Congress. But that's one thing. That's the kind of way I maybe view, view Bernie right now. But to actually support him and be an active supporter from the beginning is is a very different thing. So if there are any former Ron Paul people that have been Bernie Sanders people this whole time, I mean, chose him over Rand Paul. That is someone I would be very uh, curious to to pick their brain on. I, I actually I was thinking about this, and I, I think there's a, a certain danger to, to Bernie Sanders with his economic ideas. Because I was kind of along your point where you know if he's if there's a Republican House and Senate, uh, his economic ideas won't go anywhere. But I think there's a danger to his economic ideas being talked about more and more, and you know getting kind of a, a foothold in the collective consciousness, whereas. The more people hear about, oh, free college, free this, free that, they're going to, you know, if, if it's talked about for four years or eight years, eventually they're going to say, why don't we have free college yet? Why don't we have free health care or a single payer health care? So, and the more it's talked about, the more people just accept it. And, you know, eventually it might become a reality, which would just be a disaster economically. So I'm actually kind of worried about that. No, I mean, I, there, I agree. I don't think his ideas should get you know that much more traction but uh to me that is outweighed by the idea of like ted cruz or marco rubio just bombing the crap out of the middle east and really not being all that much better economically because they're just going to be crony capitalists and screwing people over in that way anyway so i mean yeah there's not a good scenario coming so (laughs) i think we can we can all accept that at this point yeah, with I mean, with regards to the just the college bubble, just that one thing. I mean, free college or or not free college, the system's going to implode either way. 
Um, it, it's just it's just a matter of if if they give everyone free college, it probably just happen more quickly. So I, I, I mean, that's not I, I don't know. I mean, it's it seems like that's becoming more of a mainstream democratic uh, policy. I think Hillary's starting to say things that she would, you know, be in favor of giving everyone free college, which it's it's stupid and there's no way it's it's sustainable. But that's the way the Democrats are going. So I, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm, I, I forget where I'm going with this myself. It's already but, getting know. a foothold. That's because you're the one drinking whiskey at noon. Probably, probably. All right. So before we wrap things up, why don't we do uh, something we've been doing a lot lately on these shows, and we'll do a little uh, short-term future prediction here. So uh, I'm not I'm not around next weekend. So uh, hopefully we're going to be able to gather some sort of crew to talk about the Democrat and Republican debates. Yes, there are even more next week, but. But next week, it'll be a little bit of a different dynamic, I think, because it's going to be after the New Hampshire vote. And I do think we're going to see a, a few of these guys got to drop out after New Hampshire. Uh, so why don't we do two things? We'll make two predictions each, and they will be – why don't we say top three in New Hampshire uh, for, for the Republicans? and then uh, Or you can also do the Democrat prediction as well there. And then um, who will drop out by the next debate? And I don't think Hillary or Bernie will, obviously. So we'll just talk about the Republicans for that. So, Odie, why don't we start with your New Hampshire predictions for both sides? All right, let's start on the, I'll start on the Democrat side. I think that's pretty easy. It's going to be Bernie. I think he'll probably win by 15, 10 to 15%. Uh, pretty pretty safe lead there. On the Republican side, I, I do think Trump's going to win. I think it'll be a little bit closer. Um, before this debate, I thought Rubio would come in a strong second. Now, I'm, I'm not too sure. I, I could see someone like a, like a John Kasich, as surprising as that sounds, jumping up there to the number two spot and Rubio in the number three spot. I think Cruz is going to uh, drop off significantly. I think Carson's barely going to register in New Hampshire. And then to answer your last question, who's going to drop out? I, I think Ben Ben Carson's days are numbered for sure. I've, I think he does have a lot of money, but with no support, what good does money do? Uh, I think Carly Carly Fiorina. We've forgotten about her. I think. Oh she's, yeah, what happened to her? Much, she's pretty much done. Was she the remaining undercard candidate with no undercard debate? Basically, <laughs> is is Jim Gilmore still in? I, I think he. Know. Yeah, he has not dropped out. Gilmore and Carly were just having a little tea I party. Think he'll drop out thing. too. <laughs> And I don't know. I think everyone else will probably hang around. I think Christy will hang around. And Santorum has dropped out and endorsed Rubio. He doesn't know why, though. He just he does not know why. Did you see that clip too? He was like, "What? Can you name something Marco Rubio has accomplished uh, that is why you support him?" He's like, "No, <laughs> not really." That's not, that's not a fair question. To ask that's an unfair story. question. Wait, really? You just endorsed him? You don't have one reason? Uh, Actually, I think Christy asked Rubio to say what he's accomplished. As a senator, and it was quite a weak answer. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there's not a lot to talk about as far as why Rubio is <laughs> your candidate of choice. Um, as far as my predictions, Odie completely stole all my thunder. I, I was going to say, I think Bernie actually wins by 20. I think it's a route in, on the Democrats. I think Kasich does a, a very strong number. A strong number two, uh, very close to Trump, and Rubio trailing pretty good as far as number three. I also think that Carly will drop out. And um, when is the next debate? <laughs> it's a, a week after last one. It's, a, it's this coming Saturday. <laughs> so I think Ben will still be in by next Saturday, but he will drop out shortly after that. So I, I think we get one more debate with Ben. Um, and I'm looking forward to what he does. Next. I mean, I support him being in the debates. I mean, geez, <laughs> Run, running or not. Um, <laughs> yeah. What if he said I'm dropping out of the race, but I'm not dropping out of the debates? <laughs> Would that be allowed? We actually forgot to talk about another great moment at, at the start of the debate. They had Lindsey Graham and John McCain, like talking in a balcony right before the show opened. And uh, I just thought of the two guys from the Muppets, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that they're, they are also included in every future debate. That would make my life much better. That is hilarious. St Statler and Waldorf, I believe you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I don't know which would be which, but. Well, I'm sure they're interchangeable. That could be a whole nother show altogether. <laughs> John McCain and Lindsey Graham as, as Statler and Waldorf. That would be great if they cut to them, like for commentary in a balcony, like during the debate, like. <laughs> Uh, Odie, did you see that? I was like, "What? What is going on here?" Lindsey Graham is, is comedic opening. <laughs> I, I missed that, unfortunately. Uh -oh. I don't know how I missed that. 
ABC was on top of their game yesterday. Yeah. All right. I will give my predictions, and uh, they're not vastly different from you guys. Uh, I do think Trump is going to win New Hampshire. Uh, you know, these these fake live free or dyers, they always think that they're, uh, you know, anti-establishment, and yet they always vote for, you know, guys that aren't really pro-freedom. But I think that they vote for people who they feel like seems that way, if that makes sense. So I think they're going to vote for Trump uh, for the most part. And I think he's going to do very well. I think he's going to win like 35, 40% of the vote. And then, um, I, yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't know, until a couple of days ago, I might have said Rubio might pull in second, but it sounds like he got crushed pretty hard in this debate. Um, I'm going to still say that Kasich, I think that Kasich will be second because he seems to have actually, he's polled pretty well in New Hampshire and he's, he's got his whole ground game there, I guess, too. So I, I'm going to say Kasich second and I think Cruz is not dead in the water at all. I mean, he just won Iowa. So I'm going to put slot Cruz in at third. And then um, I do think, I think we're still going to see Ben Carson at like fourth or fifth. I don't know. People just seem to keep voting for the guy. I, I can't explain it. I think it's the, it's the fuck it vote. You know, it's just like, ah, I don't know. Screw it. It's Carson. He's, he's ridiculous. Forget it. Maybe all the people that supported GW for all his bumbling antics are really finding a, a person to embrace with Ben Carson. They found their guy. <laughs> like, we've been missing this kind of quality in a, a leader. Guy who just has no awareness or, I don't know, whatever you want to call it. All right. Well, a week from now, you'll hopefully be hearing our voices uh Doing this again, <laughs> talking about all this fine stuff, all these debates, and uh, we'll see if things have been shaken up anymore. Uh, and then this coming Wednesday on the show, I've got another interview. We're returning back to our interview format. I've got a great guy by the name of Fergus Hodgson. He's the editor-in-chief of the Pan Am Post, and we're going to talk about a little place known as Cuba, a place that he recently visited and wanted to dispel some myths from. So stay tuned for that. And uh, until next time, guys, why don't you join me? Until then, live long! And, and live, live free. free.